Christmas greetings to everybody. I did not send specific Catholic greetings as I've done over the last five years, partly because my duties as chairman of the Conference of Churches Grenada meant that I had to prepare a message from the conference. So tonight, I want to reach to each of you who are here and indeed to the church in Grenada and the church in the diaspora and to share with you as your bishop, in a sense your elder brother and I hope a friend. So Christmas greetings to every faithful Catholic in the diocese and to all people with Grenadian and Caribbean roots. Christmas greetings to those who have been active in church during the year and to those who we meet through our media platforms on Good News Catholic Communications. Greetings to our young people, especially those who are struggling with church and with life. I share your concern and uh, I really would love to be able to see more of you and to share more with you. Greetings to our lapsed Catholics and our searching Catholics because one of the great things about the present pontificate of Francis is that he is very clear that every baptized Catholic belongs to the church has a place in the church. And no matter what journey you may be on, the church still looks upon you with love, respects you as far as we know how to do that, and of course, would love to see you sharing more deeply in the mystery of Christ. I want to say a special word of greeting to the homecomers, the Grenadians who have come for Christmas, I've met some of you in some strange places, on the beach, in the supermarket. And everywhere I've met these homecomers, they've had a word of encouragement. They've had a word of hope. They're happy to be home. And they want to be able to make a contribution to home in any way that they can. So it's great to have you home. I want to greet all our church workers. Since I've come as bishop, one of my concerns has been justice to those who work for the church. I feel we don't do justice to those who work for the church. That's been something that's been going on for a long time. And uh, my predecessors in priesthood and episcopal office thought it was easy to say, you know, God will reward you. And some people talk to me as a bishop when I say, you know, oh, this is problematic and that is, but they say, oh, bishop, don't worry. God will reward you. That's nice to hear. But if you have a family to support, you have a problem. Because you can't wait on God to reward you when you have a family to support and care for. So one of the part of the agenda for next year has to be that we not only greet people and say we're grateful for the work that you do, but that we seek to do justice by them. The people who work with Caritas and Yak. Yak is one of the signs of hope for the church here. And I was in Panama a few weeks ago, and I was able with Mr. Darius to share on the work of Yak. And uh, we got very, very good feedback on what we're doing and even a desire in other dioceses to replicate that work. We greet those in our homes for the aged, some of whom will be tuned in this evening, the workers and the residents. We have not integrated these homes properly into the life of the church. They were started by priests who cared. Priests who felt that the church could not just let the old parishioners go by the wayside. 
In those days, it was easy to say, bring a hana fig, bring a piece of the goat that you kill, a bit of pig and pork and so on, and we could feed them. That's no longer possible. That's no longer possible. So these homes have become a tremendous challenge to the diocese, and uh, we have to be concerned about them. I want to say a special word of greeting to the staff of Good News Catholic Communications, through whom this is reaching to all corners of the globe. I have been very, very, very happily surprised when people meet me and say, oh, you the bishop? Yes. I'm so happy, one person said, I'm so happy to meet you in the flesh. What does that mean? And then she said, because I see you. And she had come back to Grenada from way down in South America, Chile to be exact. So to all of you who share this work, this ministry, because that is what it is, a ministry, and who pose particular challenges to us as church, not only to share faith with you, but to allow you to share your faith with others. To all of you, we say thanks. Then to all our visitors who are here in the cathedral with us from various parts of the world. You've come to Grenada at Christmas time, and I hope that you get to know something of how we Grenadians live and share Christmas. It's great to come to a place at Christmas time and learn nothing. My second Christmas here in Grenada, I was very happy to meet a group of young people who had come on a yacht. The yacht was tied up on the bay marina. And uh, I met them because a family, a Grenadian family, had invited them for lunch, even as they had invited the bishop. So we welcome you, and we hope that you'll stay and that your presence within our Catholic community had bears fruit in plenty. Last but not least, I want to greet our religious sisters, some of whom are here. I don't see any of the brothers here right now. But these men and women who have given their lives in the service of God's people, whether in education or caring for the poor and so on, you are a powerful symbol of what it means to be Christian and Catholic. And I hope you know that yourselves. Forgive us for any ways in which we fall short in honoring your commitment. But we pray that God will, in his way, guide you into that depth of communion with him to which all of us yearn. And although they will not be listening at this time, I want to greet my own priests, the clergy, the diocesan clergy, the clergy of the religious congregations who are with us here in Grenada. This has been a difficult year, and I have been asking a lot. But I hope and pray that you have seen the fruit of the work that you are doing, but also realizing that the work has only now begun. We are living in very, very challenging times. And while a lot of the world will say to be a priest is foolish, a waste of life, and so on, those of us who enter into the mystery of what God is doing in this world know that it is a very worthwhile life, a fulfilling life, but a life that stretches you to the full. So my brothers, thank you for the collaboration with me over this year. So my dear friends, to all those who have lost loved ones, I want to say a special word of greeting this evening. Some of you I know personally, but this year more than any other time in the run up to Christmas, I have been touched by the reality of a life lived and loved with people whom you care for, and then they are taken from you in the course of a year. And you have to face a night like this, ever more deeply conscious of the fact 
that there will be one less person at the Christmas table. I don't want to dwell on it too much because that may only bring in more of the pain. But I invite all of us to remember those who know that loss, to pray for them, and maybe a little telephone call in the course of the day or the season may be quite appropriate. The Christmas message is a very straightforward one. And the Christmas liturgy and its readings begin with these words. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. I want to make it clear that it is in those initial words that we are invited to enter into the celebration tonight. That God comes as light, yes, but he comes as light precisely because he honors our darkness. We walk in darkness. The true meaning of Christmas is only found when we acknowledge that darkness. In Jesus' time, the darkness was the dominance of the Roman Empire. The darkness was the fact that the people of Judea and so on were poor, dirt poor. They were suffering. They were hoping that somebody would come who would free them from the oppression under which they were living. In our own time, what is that darkness? Pope Francis begins his Christmas message with the words, what does this night still have to say to our lives? And I was very struck by that. What does this night still have to say to our lives? Because it means that Francis is in tune with something that has bothered me a lot in recent years. Are we really in celebrating the liturgy, helping you to be in tune with what the liturgy is saying because the liturgy itself is in tune with your life. Sadly, I think in many instances, we're not getting there. So when the Pope says, what does this night still have to say to us? He's inviting you to realize we come every year we come every year to celebrate Christmas. But each year, what is happening? Are we able to identify anything in the particular year that brings us to church in a way that is meaningful? What is the darkness now? It's easy to see what we face with the materialism that is so rampant, with the petty self-centeredness that somebody ranted about with me earlier today, that the world is still very far from the love that we claim we ought to have. That is part of the darkness. But that is a general darkness. Can each of us identify the darkness of our own lives? Can we say, I walk in darkness and therefore when I come to celebrate Christmas, I hope, oh God, that you are in fact going to give me the light, to lead me into the light. Can we really honor that this Christmas? So what Pope Francis is inviting and what the Christmas message always invites us to do every year is to reach out to find a true and a deeper meaning for Christmas each year. The great African-American theologian Howard Thurman had this to say. The true meaning of Christmas is expressed in the sharing of one's graces in a world in which it is so easy to become callous, insensitive, and hard. And that's a word especially for our young people. If you're not there yet, know that that is one of the challenges that you will face, to become callous, insensitive, and hard. For us older people, are we becoming callous, insensitive, and hard? What Dr. Thurman says is, once this spirit 
becomes part of a life. The spirit that enables us to share the grace that God gives us with a world in which people are becoming callous, insensitive, and hard, then every day is Christmas because every day is challenging you not to be callous, insensitive, and hard. And I want to invite you, because I've had to do it for myself, to really ask yourself, what are the things that have happened this year that have made you want to become more self-centered, more selfish, more greedy, saying to yourself, I don't have to care about anybody? Have things happened to you that have brought you to that point? And can you tonight reject that and invite yourself and maybe those around you to take a different approach to life? It will not be easy. It is when we make that choice that we begin to see the presence of God among us. The presence of God in our own lives, in our own hearts. And the second reading from the letter of Paul to Titus puts it very simply. That we have to claim the power that God shares with us to broaden and deepen our understanding of what is good. God's grace has appeared and he has made salvation known to everyone. But Paul sums it up very simply. He says it is to have no ambition except to do good. To claim the power of God. To live lives rooted in goodness. When for a general, in, in a general way, we are too shallow, too narrow in our vision of the good. I'm amazed at how this world is just expanding. The possibilities are tremendous. A gentleman was asked on television the other night, um, what do you think the future holds? And he says, okay, I see this, I see that, I see the other. But when I see the progress that we have made over the past 50 years, I cannot believe in anything but the power of this world to develop to create more and more possibilities for human beings. But what we have to be aware of is that even in the midst of that, there are great dangers. It is easy to become satisfied, yes, but it is also easy to be handicapped in the midst of everything that is. I've been pondering this for some time now. And I was caught in between joining my friend and saying, yes, we're making tremendous progress, but also recognizing the dangers. I've walked with a statement that a young person said to me once. He says, I want no part of Facebook or Twitter or any one of those things. I said, why? He says, because they have destroyed the best relationship I had. He was a friend with somebody. And that friend went in a particular direction that he could not agree with, and he had to choose. It is easy in the midst of all that is going on to say, I have no control over this, just let it be. And I was really myself thinking a lot about that and wondering what should be the position of the church in the midst of all of this. Pope Francis is very clearly calling us to love the world no matter what. Not to yield to the temptation to see evil everywhere. Not to yield to the temptation of what we see on the television coming out of the United States all the time which is calling itself Catholic, but is very far, very, very far from the official vision of the church today, which began with the Second Vatican Council. 
So where do we lay down our bucket, so to speak? Where do we begin to do what is necessary? How do we do the good work that God is calling us to do? Some of you know that I'm very, very committed and I'm very grateful to God for how he walks with me in some difficult situations. And uh, this week I had two experiences, one of which I want to share with you. Because it said to me that you have to avoid the temptation to see evil everywhere. To see wickedness in every difficult situation. And that is one way to do the good. A young man whom I've known for four years walked into my office. I had not seen him for more than a year, partly because of COVID and all that. When he'd come to see me previously, he was all active and dynamic bishop, always pursuing something. And he was determined to get a bit of church property to do some work himself. I had to refuse him over the years because of advice. When he came in this time, he came in with a walking stick, hobbling along. What's wrong? He said, let me sit down. And he began to talk. But he could not sit down properly. Because he told me the only way he sits comfortably is when he has a donut. Some of you will know what a donut is. You know. he, told a, he told a terrible story of falling in a supermarket on shampoo. The bottle had burst right by the cash register. And before it was cleaned up, he fell. He talked about struggling because he had fractured his coccyx. I hope I'm, pronounc I'm pronouncing that right, coccyx or coccyx. So. And he was in pain for the whole year. So I listened. I listened to the trials he went through, trying to get medical attention and all that. And my mind was going down the road of, how can I help? How can I help? You know? When somebody walks into my office with a story like that, they need help. They come by the bishop because they want help. So as I was bringing the conversation to a close, I said, how can I help? And this young man said to me, Bishop, I don't need help, you know. I don't need your help if you're reaching into your pocket to give me something. And then he said, my family doesn't love me. My siblings are all envious of me and the fact that I work hard and that I've made something of myself working hard. My mother never loved me. That's his opinion. I'm not too sure if that is true. But this was a young man facing tremendous adversity but yet committed to making it not looking for any handout or anything like that, but showing me, especially in the way we prayed afterwards, that here was somebody who believed that the grace of God was in him. In him I saw alive the words of Paul to Titus, to have no ambition except to do good. And that is the challenge I leave with you again this year, this night. It is easy as we face the challenges that we have to face, to get to feel sorry for ourselves. It is easy when life becomes difficult, and it becomes difficult for anybody who is trying to live their lives to the full, to want to become a victim. This young man is very clear. Nobody is going to make him a victim. 
we talked a bit about how I could help him further. You know. But he made my week. And that's why I'm sharing it with you tonight. Because the Christmas story is not simply about the baby in a manger. The heart of the Christmas story is the word was made flesh and lived among us. The simplicity of the manger scene, the child comes with no ambition except to do good. And this is something we miss with the Jesus story. We make it seem as if he came to save everybody. I don't believe that Jesus came knowing a lot of the theology that we now know. He came to show the love of God. He came to challenge the world in which he was living about that love made visible. And they crucified him not because he came to save us and they didn't want to be saved. They crucified him because he wanted to show us what it means to do good and that was the last thing they wanted to know. Doing good. No. We have to be self-centered. The figure of Judas looking after himself. Concerned only about himself. But the message of Judas is also important. Because the message of Judas is when you live your life that way, it leads to you deciding to end it yourself. And if you know anybody who is tempted to end their life themselves, just invite them to think about some other person for whom they could live their lives. It makes a big difference. And so my friends, we celebrate Christmas this year aware of much darkness around us. One of the lessons of these times is that there is no perfection to which we are aiming, which we will be able to achieve ourselves. We thought, at least the world thought, that when the Soviet Union fell apart, we were headed towards this great democratic world in which everybody would live in great democracies and we would have peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Nope. Darkness is ever present around us. And yet the God of grace and goodness is ever with us. And that is the message of tonight. God comes as a little child so that God may be available to all of us. If God had come in the first instance as a grown man, some people would be able to say, ah. but a little child draws all of us. The little child running in the church aisle makes all of us somehow sit up and look and enjoy. Thanks to the parent of that child for not trying to pull him away and make him sit down and be a big child. Right. I always rejoice when we as a Christian community can have a little child in our midst and allow that child the freedom of our church community and love that child as he gets accustomed to church, not as a place in which he is in chains, but a place in which he is able to rejoice. So I think God has given us a little gift as I end my homily this evening. And I hope that wherever you go this year, in the year to come, you will have no ambition except to do good. And in doing it, you will help the young among us to, to come to that ambition for themselves. Amen.